afternoon to talk to you all today, especially in the presence of Dr. Palam Raju and, of course, our action secretary, Ms. Sharma. Uh, this talk is meant to sort of motivate you into the future and tell you why embedded systems is so important today, why is it a new wine that needs any, anything that is interesting today that you try it. So my story will be told in a, in a by way of relating it to compelling applications, and these are just a few applications that I've listed here. Uh, one being computation of fluid dynamics, and tell you a little bit of what's happening in the Boeing company. A little bit about molecular dynamics, again that's a compelling application, and then about life sciences and its relationship to personalized medicine. And lastly, I will not talk much about mission intelligence. We already heard about it. But I'd like to say one thing, though, that we would like to have a, we would like to move into a world where we have a processor or a system on a chip that comprises thousands of neurons. And you would just want to connect them together the way you would want it to form, to give you what is called the cognitive edge. But at that little note, and I'm going to visit this slide from the Boeing folks uh, just to tell you how computational fluid dynamics is important. Now, all of us know that computational fluid dynamics is something fine, but then high performance computing or the beta beta scale computing or exascale computing can take you only that far. But hidden inside any of these applications is the need to have specialized acceleration. And the specialized acceleration does not need a great deal of rocket science. So if you look at the way the Boeing company has been using computational fluid dynamics from the point of view of computing, you'll see that every 10 years, there is an increase in the megaflow rating of the platform that we want. And I'm going to skip through all this and come towards the end. Uh, around 2000, when they were having the 737, the most successful aircraft, you would see that the CFT was done using platforms that were about 100 gigaflops. And today, with the Dreamliner in place, where you will see in the next slide that almost everything was simulated using CFD, I think we have moved to a space where we need better scale computing and maybe even, learn, even, even larger scale computing. But the key is that it is not the better scale computing. It is being able to specialize your computations. It's being able to have specialized hardware that is embedded into your system. It is embedded into your high, high performance computing stations. So this is what is the green line now, and you can clearly see that there is CFD that is performed on almost every aspect of that plane. So the closing parts from the Boeing folks, I would, uh, I would get to the last part, wherein what are the impediments, impediments that, that do not allow us to scale? And that is because the applications do not scale well because we want, though we may have thousands of processors and with sufficient memory, it's just that there is something in that application that needs a different kind of, kind of acceleration. And that is science. Whereas, if you were to run hundreds of simulations of different situations, and you want to do it on limited capacity, that is engineering. So the engineering can be handled. It's only the other thing whether you need specialized computing and you need to assist the existing platform that you have to think differently, you have to come up with additional, <coughs> additional innovation, and that needs to be embedded. Again, the other application domain that is the molecular dynamics. Well, nothing much. It is basically computing the force equations under different scenarios. Okay? Now, this is various applications. And if we are to again look at the scaling challenges of molecular dynamics, we would see that to just simulate 1.96, about 2 frames per second of a molecular movement of the bond, how the bond reacts, 
you need about one millisecond of compute time for every step. That essentially means in a day you can only simulate effectively 170 nanosecond worth of, of, the, of the molecular movement. And this is for a system which is about 10 to the power 5 molecules. Okay, things could get even complex, and we want to get to a scenario where even if we can simulate 200 microseconds of the molecular dynamics in one day, that's a big deal. What about 25th century life sciences? We all know that the medicines that we have today that have been prescribed to us is an average medicine. It, up to, it sort of works. But then, it is not really the right medicine for you. And we would essentially want to have a scenario. We want to get to that scenario wherein there is, there is what is called designer medicines, the medicine that is just the right medicine for me and for you. So this can happen with what is called the <laughs> sequence alignment, and this is what is the uh, what is the killing application of the 25th century life sciences, because we are dealing with 25,000 genes with about 3 billion base pairs <coughs> of nucleotides, and there are 46 chromosomes. Basically, the operation is very simple. It is pattern matching. And what you're actually doing is with these few characters, you are trying to you are trying to compare two sequences and you want to essentially find out three elements. The one which is which is not visible here, that's a lighter one, lighter color, that corresponds to the perfect matches, the green corresponds to mismatches, and the blue corresponds to some omission or deletions. And uh, Essentially, the whole sequence alignment is that of scoring each position independently and, and arriving at some cost metric. So basically, what I want to say here is that today, the genome sequencing costs about a million dollars. And to make it available for personalized medicine, we would have to think of scenarios wherein we can bring down the cost to maybe $10,000 to begin with, down to volume is going to bring down the prices. So, what are the essential dimensions? Essential dimensions are sciences. So it involves mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, all of them together define your applications. And the next dimension is what engineering has to offer to get to solve your problems. And engineering is all about the system architecture. It's about the hardware that is going to be used, deployed for your solution, and the design aids. They could be software aids, they could be other simulation aids, or it could even be aids for prototype. And the most important dimension here is you might have engineered a solution but do you have the technology to deliver it? And therefore, technology is the key in terms of, again, three dimensions. There's a performance. There's a limit to the performance that a given technology can offer you. Can you do better? What needs to be done to advance the technology from the performance point of view? What about power? We talked about devices. Shiva talked to you about special devices and how it scales to 22 nanometers. Believe me, when you're going down to 22 nanometers and below, we are faced with immense power issues. A thousand core multi-core cannot even be utilized worth about, to the, uh, it can only be utilized 10% of the time. That essentially means we are hitting a utilization wall, or in other words, you need to have silicon where portions of it are thin. You cannot keep every part of the silicon active, and that is what is called dark silicon. So, and lastly, this is a very important aspect for protection, and this has been a concern for the nation, as nation and especially the defense organizations, because when we buy hardware, when we buy intellectual property, we are not sure what it contains. 
there may be malware out there, and it's an increasing concern how we can overcome this issue. So basically, the embedded system, which is basically the, the meeting point of all of this, is what is going to give you a solution, will possibly give you a specialized solution that will essentially address the totality of the problem from application down to realization so that it can be deployed. So, so having said that, there are practical issues. There is what is called the design productivity gap. Most law tells us how the devices are going to scale, how performance is going to scale, how the cost is going to go down. But then there is also a big gap between what kind of hardware or what kind of solution can be provided by technology versus what is required by your application. So this is the big gap out here. We are talking about today, today we have, we have the chips or silicon chips which have close to bullet transistors. So by the time it is by the time it is 2020, we will be talking in terms of hundreds of billions of transistors on a chip. The question is how do you manage them? How do you essentially harness the power of these devices? That is one aspect. Second is the quality problem. This I just said earlier in a different way saying that you may not be able to use all the devices that you have because of the power, power issue. So basically you can clearly see on this plot here, on the y-axis is the millions of instructions per milliwatt. So how much computer power you can get for a little amount of power, and on this x-axis is the flexibility. So clearly, if you had your own hardware solution, or an ASA, that is the best. And if you had something that was in terms of processor-based solutions, microprocessors, then you're going to have at least a one to thousand x performance or a quality quality uh, quality difference. Now let me tell you one thing. When I write embedded processes here, I do not mean embedded processes. What the embedded system that I'm talking about is right here. The V configured processor or logic. These are the accelerators that are going to be part of your specialized systems, which are basically high performance systems for high performance applications. So we are talking about scenarios where you are very close to dedicated hardware, but then that hardware is programmable, programmable for your applications in that small domain. Okay? And this is where lies, lies the key. Because technology-wise, if we are going to build a chip for every application, there is going to be issue of cost. Can anyone afford the NRE cost, the recurring, non recurring expenditure, if there is no volume? Whereas, if you bring several applications <coughs> together into one platform which can be organized itself, then you have virtually increased the volume and it is a single chip or a single embedded system that can cater to multiple applications. And I'm going to show you how this is done. <coughs> the way we would go about this, ideally, this is the way you would want to. You would want to write your application the way you find it most comfortable. Write it in a high level language. Our software folks can do this very easily. But after that, we should, we should not involve the software folks in <coughs> delivering this as a solution on the world's best platform. So this rest of it should happen automatically. In other words, there should be engineering tools or aids that allow you to move it to some intermediate form, that's a graph. Then what you do is you would, this is something that's happening internally, there's some magic out there, you break it down into smaller problems, and then you essentially have what is called a bunch of operations that you want to realize. So the question is, this flow looks good. Can it really be done? And yes, I'm going to give you an animated demonstration of that. This has been done with respect to the redefined architecture, the redefined system on chip architecture, which 
was developed at the final lab with, with four PhDs graduating out of this, uh, this activity. This redefined system on chip architecture is also the main, uh, is, a, is the main activity of morphing machines, the company that I incubated out of IISC. So what you see here is basically an interconnection of computing tiles, and there is a network on chip that connects them, and then there is some hardware logic around them. Now, look at the animation. So you have those few operations, macro operations to be performed. They come over, the hardware schedules them. Let me tell you, there's no software layer here that would slow down things. The, the, the effect of controlling is also done in hardware. And therefore, you can clearly see that things go into their right places, they communicate, they interact, and essentially the same fabric can be used differently at different points of time. Or in other words, if this is the this is the raw piece of hardware, post silicon, you don't have to fab this every time. Depending on your application, in space and time, you use different portions of it differently, and that is how you are able to exploit the benefits of a single hardware that can cater to multiple applications differently in different ways. And this also addresses the danger of dark silicon that I said. Because by virtue of the fact that you're distributing in space and time, you are able to keep the, keep the utilization levels to levels which can handle the power density. So, I would like to summarize, say, the future of embedded systems will be post-silicon realization of my system on a chip. It is really what I want to do best, and that is what is the future. And in this August gathering, I would like to make a request to Dr. Rajiv that we should, uh, we should uh, be in a position to encourage this activity in a multi-institutional multi way, in a big way, such that tomorrow, we have our own system on chip. We are we are with the technology or ahead of the technology, and there isn't any dependencies on the outside world. Thank you.